In this video, we'll solve the Schrodinger equation for our first model system, the particle in a box. So as with all quantum model systems, what we need to do is to specify our potential energy function as a function of whatever variables we have. So the particle in a box is going to be one dimensional, so we can call that variable x. So we need to specify what the potential energy is at all values of x. So that is going to be defined as follows. So the potential is zero if x is between zero and a value called L. So these will be our two bounds of the box, the left edge and the right edge of the box being at zero and L respectively. So it's the potential is zero inside the box and it's infinity otherwise. So basically the particle has to stay inside the box because otherwise it would have an infinite potential energy. So our Schrodinger equation, as we remind ourselves, is h psi equals e psi. The Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function gives the total energy times the wave function again. So our Hamiltonian operator is minus h bar squared over 2 times mass times second derivative of the wave function with respect to x plus our potential energy function, which inside the box is going to be 0 times the wave function is equal to our total energy times psi of x, our wave function, once again. Okay, so we can move some things around, multiply both sides by, uh, looks like, negative 2m over h bar squared. That leaves us with the second derivative of our wave function is equal to negative 2me over h bar squared times the wave function. So just as with our solution of the classical wave equation, whenever you have the second derivative of a function equals a negative constant times the same function, the solution to that is generally going to be sines and cosines. Now, yes, for those of you who have taken a differential equations course, you can take some other steps that I've skipped over, but that's this is where you end up after a few more steps of math. Okay, so our wave function is going to be some combination of sines and cosines. So a cosine kx plus b sine kx, where a, b, and k are all constants. In this case, the constant k is going to be, this is negative k squared here that our function is equal to on the right side. So k is going to be the square root of 2 times mass times total energy over h bar. Okay, now just as with the classical wave equation for the vibrating string, we're going to solve the rest of this for a and b by using our boundary conditions. So our boundary conditions are that since the wave, since we can't have our particle outside the box where the potential energy is infinite, the wave function is going to be zero everywhere outside the box. But it's also got to be zero right on the border of the box because the wave function needs to be continuous. It can't have any breaks or any jumps in, in its function value. So that means uh, not only is psi of x less than 0, but also x equals 0 is going to be equal to 0. So psi of 0 equals 0. Similarly, for x greater than or equal to L, which is x greater than and x equal to L equals 0, so psi of L equals 0. So if we substitute in those two boundary conditions for our case here, we have psi of 0 equals a cosine k0 plus b sine k0. Uh, the sine of k0 is the sine of 0, which is just 0. And the cosine of k0 is the cosine of 0. The cosine of 0 is 1. So this whole thing here ends up becoming a. So psi of 0, psi of zero equals a. Psi of 0 must equal 0. So a must equal 0. There goes our cosine term. We're just left with a sine term. Okay, so psi of l our other boundary condition has to equal 0, so b sine uh, kl equals 0. So kl has to be something that is going to give us a 0. So kl is going to give us is something where the sine of that is equal to 0. So we ask ourselves, where does the sine function equal 0? At what angles? Well, it's true at 0 go up to 1 at 90 degrees, back down at 180, pi radians, you're at 0 again, 270, you're at negative 1, 360, or 2 pi radians, you're back at 0 again. So the arc sine of 0 is every integer value 
times pi. So notice that this is where our quantization comes from in the particle in a box because this n is a quantized value because it's only the values of sine that equal zero. So k in this case has to equal n pi over l once we see that kl equals n pi. And this n is going to be some integer here as well. Okay, so if our k is our n pi over l, we can substitute that in. Psi n of x equals the constant b times sine n pi x over l. And n is going to be some integer. It's going to start at 1, and it's going to go up from there. So we got k up here equals n pi over l. But we also know from our original differential equation that k equals the square root of 2me over h bar. So we can solve this equation by setting those two values of k equal to each other and solving for what that gives us. So we need to isolate e by itself. So we got to square both sides, and I'm also going to multiply uh, by h bar before I do that. So I get an n squared, pi squared, h bar squared over l squared equals 2me. Square root of 2me squared is 2me. So dividing both sides by 2m and then transferring out uh, the difference between h bar and h. Remember, h bar equals h over 2 pi. So that ends up giving us, if you refactor this, that the energy as a function of n equals h squared, Planck's constant squared, n squared, our quantum number, or this integer n. So h squared, n squared over 8 times the mass of the particle times the length of the box squared. So this n, as I mentioned, is a quantum number. As the value of n goes up, the energy is going to go up as we go. As the box gets bigger, our energy levels will get closer together. As the box gets smaller, this denominator will get smaller, so the energy levels will get further apart. Uh, smaller mass means the energy levels separate more. So for big masses, the energy levels get much closer together. So quantum mechanics, as we see, does not take part for objects that are very, very heavy. Also for those that have a very large uh, box to move around in. So it really is the confinement to very, very small length scales that makes quantum behavior occur here, as well as it is the mass being a very, very small uh, subatomic size mass. So that's it for this. One detail remaining is what this value of b is, and that's what we're going to look in the next video where we discuss how to use normalization to figure out what this constant is.